The GPS system consists of a constellation of satellites orbiting at around 11,000 miles, at speeds allowing them to circle the Earth every 12 hours. With at least 24 satellites in the main network, and some additional ones as well, many places on Earth usually have signal coverage from multiple satellites at a time. This is a good thing, as there's a minimum number of satellites required for the receivers like on our aircraft to properly work. We need to have reception of signals from at least four different satellites in order to determine our position accurately. Because the satellites are in motion relative to the ground, at 12-hour orbits they move faster than the Earth is rotating, we have different satellites in view at any given time. With enough satellites in the full network though, we should be able to pick up the minimum number for navigation. At times, satellites can develop faults, and if one of the four that we're using is faulty, our receiver could compute a position different than where we actually are. Sometimes these differences don't amount to much, but depending on the geometry of the satellites we're receiving, it could cause a larger error than what's acceptable on an IFR flight. Older GPS units, suitable for IFR flight, but without any ground-based augmentation, are identified by the FAA as TSO-129 or 196. An example would be the Garmin 430 or 530 without what's called a WAS capability. A faulty signal on these units would not appear to be any different to the user than any other accurate one would. The integrity of the position can't be assured. The way to correct for this is by receiving signals from more than the minimum four satellites. If a fifth satellite is visible, a series of positions can be computed using a combination of any four satellites at a time. If one of the position computations is different from the others, due to one of the satellite signals being faulty, that signal can be ignored and the position will be computed using the four remaining birds. This is called Receiver Autonomous Integrity Monitoring, or RAIM. As we can see here, a minimum of not just four, but five satellites is required for RAIM to be available. With one of the satellites excluded from the position computation, we're down to a minimum of four operative ones again. This doesn't necessarily mean that RAIM is unavailable now. The unit accepts only the position computed off the four satellites that are in agreement with each other. Some units are able to exclude the faulty satellite altogether using fault detection and exclusion. By ignoring the fifth satellite completely, full integrity monitoring can continue, but only if a new sixth satellite is in view, providing a check against the four satellites that are working and included by the receiver. RAIM availability is based off the position of the satellites, which can be predicted to a very fine accuracy due to their stable orbits. For a given flight route at a given time, we're able to compute how many satellites will be available in the network, and thus when RAIM will or won't be available. If at least the main network of 24 satellites is available, RAIM coverage is assured. The modern GPS system of 31 satellites guarantees an almost 100% RAIM coverage rate. However, there are still instances where RAIM will be unavailable. These can be checked using an FAA tool or prediction software. ForeFlight provides a method of inputting a flight route and time of departure and arrival and computing whether RAIM will be available or not. Using these older units, an IFR flight can't be made without an alternate form of navigation suitable for the route like VOR. If a RAIM outage is predicted for a flight, we could still fly at IFR as long as we're using those alternate forms of navigation as our primary source now. RAIM capability is based off the error tolerance of the unit, which changes depending on our phase of flight. During the en route phase, we have the largest tolerance at plus or minus two miles. In the terminal phase, this is down to one. And in the approach phase, on an RNAV approach, for example, this shrinks to just 0.3 miles. If we have a loss of RAIM during or prior to the approach, we have to discontinue the RNAV approach, fly an approach with a different nav aid, or divert somewhere where RAIM is available.